Hello, you join me in Coventry because today I'm hoping to take a ride on the very new, very exciting Coventry Very Light Rail System. Its supporters claim that it could be the future of transit, but is it actually any good? Join me as I try to find out. The Coventry Very Light Rail System consists of two main parts, the tracks and the trams, both designed to have low installation and running costs. A traditional tram system typically requires foundations at least half a metre deep, although it can often be quite a bit more. One of the main breakthroughs here is a track design which can be built without needing to dig down more than 30 centimetres from the road service, avoiding the need to reroute utilities. We're not spending money moving utilities that might already be in a perfectly acceptable condition. Purely because of the design of our track form, we've made sure that our track form doesn't actually conflict with the position of where the utilities are. So if the utility is in a good condition, we should be in a position whereby we can leave those utilities behind. We still have to prove that out, uh, and at the minute we're doing that on a on a route by route basis. But we're working with the utilities to give them more confidence that them leaving their asset that's in good condition in situ, and that will save a lot of money. Another key element of the track design is the decision not to use catenary and instead power each tram with an onboard battery. This, combined with their slimmer profile, means the tracks can be installed in a matter of weeks at a cost as low as £10 million per kilometre, compared with about £50 million per kilometre for a traditional tram system. This test track is, is definitely about that. It's about us proving that we can build it for about the price that we say that we can and in the sort of time scales that we say we can. Once we've built it like, like we have and we've demonstrated it a little bit for people to give us some feedback, we'll then be using this facility for working with the utilities to practice their repair techniques and to practice if we need to removing the slab and replacing a slab so we get into that process. So with a bit of the background covered it was time to get on board for a test ride of the tram itself. All right, so we're just getting on now. I'm excited to be, see what it's like. I like the wavy uh, handrail. Oh, we're off. Yeah, it's nice. And it's got some good contours. Crikey, get some move on. <laughs> It's 70, isn't it? Top speed, 70 kilometres an hour? It can do all urban speeds, so... It, yeah. You know, officially, the track test track that we've been to has only allowed us to test it to 40. Okay. It's designed to be able to do something. As well as a top speed of 70 kilometres an hour, these vehicles also have a range of about 70 kilometres. For today's on-street testing, it was just charging using a standard car charger, However, once in service, the hope is that it can use the same rapid charging pantograph technology already in use by many buses, allowing it to charge from 10% to 90% in as little as 12 minutes. The system also utilises a novel signalling system from Universal Signalling, which works by placing RFID tags at regular intervals along the track, which then communicate with the display inside the cab to show the maximum permitted speed and can apply the brakes if this speed is exceeded. It's also able to make intelligent decisions about the routing of vehicles through the switching of points, avoiding the need for a centralised signalling centre and thus allowing for further cost savings. Unlike other modes, these trams are also entirely zero emissions, as even electric buses still have emissions from tyre breakdown and brake dust. These trams, on the other hand, use entirely regenerative braking, except in the event of an emergency. Each one weighs 11 tonnes and has a capacity of 56 people, 20 of whom can be seated. It also has a tight turn radius of 15 metres, meaning the tracks can be more easily installed in existing streets. As you can see though, it's actually pretty short when compared to most tram systems, so I asked why. We use short, shorter vehicles so that actually we match the, the standard level of demand, so that the vehicle is commonly quite full, yeah. rather than um, purely um, creating our vehicle to match peak demand, which is what most tram systems do. Now, the problem with that for most tram systems is that it means that when they're not at peak demand, they're transporting empty seats about. Now, when we look at the proportion of people that actually pay full fare on a tram system, it's a very small proportion of the people that ride it. So the actual cost of running a tram compared to the fare box um, income is disproportionate on most tram systems. Now, we're not going to change the proportion of people that are using it under concession, etc. 
So we want a system where we're driving less or we're costing less to run in the first place, but also it gives us opportunity for other revenue streams. So if we have to increase the amount of capacity to, to meet the demand by bringing another tram on board, when we're not using it, we're going to take that tram offline and then we could use that for selling the power back to the grid or we could use it to sell the capacity to light freight. And there's a range of different commercial options that actually are different to purely the fare box revenue. Another benefit of shorter vehicles is that they take up less road space and can be easily overtaken. They can be coupled together to boost capacity, but the long-term ambition is for them to operate autonomously as they'd rather run shorter vehicles at high frequencies than longer vehicles infrequently. Whether the driverless technology materialises remains to be seen, but this does help explain the somewhat unconventional vehicle design. So this is all the cab and all the... What do all the buttons do? You can tell us. <laughs> Well, you've got your saloon lights, your cab lights, your demister and your windscreen blower. The overhead charging is for when we got the overhead charging in Dudley. You've got your indicators left and right, doors close for left and right. Uh, hazard lights, your trap brake, which is on a separate circuit altogether. Uh, you've got your parking brake, apply and release, and your horn and your bell. This is your window washer and your window wipers. Then obviously you've got your, your power handle and then the uh, neutral forward and reverse and then you've got drive off and maintenance maintenance is what it's got to be in in order to charge it up very nice i'm a train driver so they've hired me and some another driver to drive this with passengers on board so this is all quite familiar to you then <laughs> Because it's an R&D program, DFT fund us through the West Midlands Combined Authority and they want us to incrementally prove the levels of technology again better and better before they give us the next lot of money. So we did all of the offline constructions as I explained outside and then they wanted us to prove that we in a live environment, in a real world environment, we could do a simple alignment so this short section. And we looked and we said to them, right, we can prove what you want to know within 220 metres. And that means that we spend the least amount of money required to prove to DFT that we can manage what they need to know technologically. Because the smaller section we can do and still prove it, it means that we can move on to the next section quicker, which means we can move on to doing the whole route faster. We need to try and get people out of cars and because um, Coventry was given a clean air order back in 2009 so the reality is we need to make the, clean, uh, the air cleaner and we know that congestion and the outputs from congestion are a major contributor to the air quality so we need to get people out of cars. Also the congestion means unreliable journey times, lots of people taking a lot longer to get to work and, and there's an economic argument about reducing congestion. What we also know is that there's very little evidence to suggest that people get out of their cars or make modal shift for buses. So, but what we can see in a number of cities like Nottingham, like obviously London with their underground system and Manchester, that people will um, give up their vehicle or move to use in public transport. And we think that's primarily due to the fact that there's a permanent way. So legislatively, the, the, the system can't be removed um, it, very easily and also we all always know it's when it's coming and where it's where it's going to gives people the confidence to actually transition from the private car into um, into public transport well almost as soon as it began we're now back having done one run there and one run back and then the same again so yeah that was my ride on the Coventry Very Light Rail. Now I'm not going to sit here and say that this is better than a conventional tram system. The use of battery power means it's never going to be as energy efficient as directly receiving power from an overhead wire, and the shorter vehicle lengths means it could have a lower capacity too, even if they end up being coupled together and running at higher frequencies. However, there's also no denying its cheaper installation and running costs, with the use of steel on steel rails being significantly more efficient than the equivalent electric bus. Therefore, I think it could be perfect for cities looking for something halfway between a bus and a tram, 
enabling them to upgrade and decarbonise their transport provision along a given corridor without being tied to the high costs of traditional tramlines. Coventry City Council owns the intellectual property for the system and its modular design means it could easily be sold to other cities around the world. So say another city wanted to have the track design with a shallower profile but then do a more traditional like overhead catenary, longer trams, that kind yep. of thing, they could do that, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, we're working to make sure that the slab track, uh, we're making a, 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 tr a, a slab called a universal slab. So that's been specifically designed so that that can carry full weight trams so that we can make the process of repairing standard tram systems much more cheaply or where we're looking at bringing some of the old beaching lines back into play that slab track system can go down on a much um, softer uh, bed than a normal track, track system so it saves a lot of money on remediation of, of the uh, current infrastructure so yes we are trying to make it so that there is a slab that can be sold uh, or used independently of the vehicle and the control system. We're also trying to make it so because some of the market are interested in the vehicle independently. So let's say for instance some place that's got lots of open space. Um, I know Sirencester have very recently talked about putting a system that goes out across the fields which they'll probably do with with sleepers and, and ballast track but actually they like the size of our vehicle because it meets their demand. So we've got an option where we can sell a slab and a, and a route associated with that that can take heavier trams. We've got a complete system which is our system with our slab track and our control system and then separately we have the vehicle on its own that could meet a demand. Okay, so as these people behind me wait to get on the next tram, I'm going to thank you very much for watching. What did you think of the Coventry Very Light Rail? Could this be the future of transport or is it a bit of a distraction from more traditional technologies like normal tramways? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'm optimistic actually about this. I, uh, I look forward to seeing if it's going to be a success or not. Anyway, appearing on your screen now is like links to other videos of mine that you can watch if you feel so inclined. But if you don't, then I'm going to thank you for watching anyway and wish you a pleasant rest of your day. Cheerio!